Yeah, for those of you that don't know me, I'm John Mills, and I'm um, a philosopher and a psychoanalyst and clinical psychologist from uh, the Toronto, uh, Greater Toronto area. And I thought um, I would. It's hard. It's hard for me to always judge the audience about what you would prefer. I, I thought maybe I would tell you about my book in a more inf uh, conversational, informational way, and um, tell you about the substance of it. But I also thought I might be able to to start uh, by uh, setting the tone by reading. A, a section out of the book, uh, out of the introduction, that might give you somewhat of an overview. Um, but before we do that, this is uh, the culmination of about 20 years of my reflections on the philosophy of the unconscious since my formal studies in philosophy. And I'm, I'm particularly drawn to certain types of meta metaphysical systems. And, and, and and thinkers that are able to encapsulate many different uh, perspectives. And so the, the, com the combination of the people I chose to write about in the book reflect that. I, um, I begin with the, the notion of the underworld in Egyptian and Greek mythology, which then uh, flows into a discussion about uh, the ancient notion of, of the soul. I feel that this actually is the premise for all philosophies of the unconscious, but we don't see this elaboration until, uh, until we get into um, psychoanalysis. This is where we start to see much more of a rich and robust system of understanding unconscious mental processes. Uh, but before Freud, there was a thinker that uh, was quite influential in anticipating psychoanalysis, and so I begin with Hegel and, and talk about how Hegel had very much prepared our discussion in, in terms of modern, uh, modern science, our modern understanding of human psychology. Uh, then I progress more in a somewhat uh, linear fashion, I mean, uh, temporal fashion, where I engage uh, Freud's unconscious ontology. And then I move into talking about the existential movement, which is very, um, very much a contemporaneous movement at the time. And here I engage the works of Heidegger and Sartre in particular. And then I uh, segue into looking at Lacan and looking at his system. And then I uh, shift uh, gears a bit, and I, I somewhat return to, didn't mean to skip him, but I return to Jung, uh, because I find his metaphysics to be quite interesting. And then I end with uh, Alfred North Whitehead and his unconscious cosmology. So I, I think at this point, um, let me read you a little bit of the introduction as a, a brief lecture. And then afterwards, um, I'll open it up to the audience for questions, and I'd be happy to discuss um, or elaborate on any of the systems in the book. The Greek conception of, of the psyche or soul may be, may be said to be ultimately concerned with the essence of the human being and various dispositions uh, composites or natures have been attributed to its organization. Uh, by today's standards, what we typically refer to as mind is a totality, including the unique features that comprise individual personality and subjectivity. The Greeks tended to emphasize its multimodal features as universal dimensions of the human condition. Because the notion of consciousness is a modern, not an ancient concept, early cultures did not have a word for the unconscious in the way it is commonly used today. Therefore, the nature of the soul was not examined in this light. But the unconscious depths of the soul were not entirely neglected, as many pre-Socratic philosophers attempted to delineate. 
Testimonia from Aristotle notes that Thales, who attributed a motive force to the notion of the soul, hence a purpose, or telos, that animates mind as a life principle. For Anaximenes, our souls hold us together. What uh, Democritus equates with thought, as well as lust for pleasure. Perhaps it is Heraclitus where we we first get some glimpse of unconscious process when he points out that the soul follows an inner law of growth that has no limit, such as in the depths of meaning, yet one that is corrupted by an impulsive desire for whatever it wants it will buy at the cost of the soul." End quote. The desirous or lustful features of the soul were often separated from its more rational faculties attributed to the intellect, reason, or mind, the bright jewel of which is wisdom. For the Pythagorean school, like the Egyptians, the soul was immortal. Life on earth was a sojourn and preparation through purification, self-discipline, and self-harmonization for entering the afterlife the destiny of which was to prepare for eternity. And for Philotius, a contemporary of Socrates, the immortal harmonia of the soul becomes incorporeal as, if, as it separates from the body upon death. Because the ancients believed in reincarnation, metapsychosis, and the transmigrification of the soul, they believed that they had lived before and, and that learning or education was a matter of recollection. Philip Wheelwright explains, quote, the fundamental truths are already known to us in the depths of our unconscious selves and the purpose of education should therefore be to stir these hidden parts of us into activity rather than to impose truths from them or upon them from outside sources. Here we can appreciate how the Socratic method of dialectic was designed to question the truth claims imposed by others and elicit knowledge that was previously forgotten, such as was demonstrated in Plato's famous dialogue, Mino. Plato's treatment of the psyche in his dialogues is vast and varied but he takes up the Pythagorean concept of the soul as comprising three parts, intelligence, reason, and passion. In the Republic, he discusses the desirous or, or appetitive soul as pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain, and that the lawless, base, beastly, and savage part, as he would say, concerned with gratifying its own instincts, quote, is found in everyone. Plato not only anticipates the Freudian unconscious, he also stimulates how desire can override reason and a sense of shame belonging to our ethical compass. It is here that we may see how Plato was the first psyche analyst, where he articulates the intimate relationship between desire, reason, and morality how the soul possesses a natural constitution that is instinctually driven, develops habits in relating to others in the environment, and that our true characteristics awaken during sleep when the soul is at rest, whether this be the, quote, rational, gentle, and dominant part, or disquieted passion, unruliness, and anger. In fact, Plato accounts for good and evil within the soul, or a better part and a worse part, as he would put it, which is subject to control and self-mastery. When the soul is able to attain a sense of self-consciousness, the more primitive forms of our nature are tamed, which settles down in a compromise, that's his quote, a compromise between our competing tendencies, only to find a middle ground or synthetic function where unbridled desires are transformed into lawful order and democratic inclinations. 
Here are the seeds of Freud's tripartite theory of the mind. Although stemming from Sophocles, following these remarkable passages in Book 9, Plato may be even credited with elaborating upon Oedipal rivalry and competition, where he compares his son's in insolence, outrage, and autocracy toward others as a reaction formation to a thrifty and niggardly father who personifies self-restraint, renunciation of pleasure, and inner discipline. Here Plato succeeds in showing how the ruling passions of the unconscious are under the influence of that tyrant Eros, responsible for every erotic and evil impulse, including the atrocity of murder, that lives in utmost anarchy and lawlessness in our sleeping souls, which is based in part on habit and nature, in reaction to and defiance of the control of his father and his laws. This could read straight out of Freud. It is no accident that he referred to psychology as his tyrant. The division of the psyche is, is further described by Plato as dialectical structure composed of opposites. In fact, of all contraries, he says, where the psychological disposition such as thought, feeling, sensation, perception, memory, and judgment transpire in order to, quote, write words in our souls, end quote. It is also the harbinger of moral qualities such as excellence, ends and virtues, aesthetics, and the pursuit of knowledge. The soul is also the house of creativity, truth, and reality, beauty, and wisdom. Furthermore, the soul is not only the cause of good and evil, as he put it, right and wrong, but a universal cause of all mental activity, which affects a person's overall character. Being both rational and irrational, of pleasure and pain, the psyche is the essence of man. Although Plato states that the psyche possesses temperament and physical constituents that belong to our embodiment, hence showing the interdependence of the mind and body, following the pre-Socratics, he ultimately believed that the soul was immortal. I will not criticize this notion here, given the long contentious debate in the history of philosophy and theology. However, we can metaphysically infer a type of unconscious infinity that we may, by analogy, apply to the soul, what Freud refers to as timeless, boundless immediacy that is, quote, virtually immortal, end quote. That's from Freud. While Plato provides a rich backdrop to the question, nature, and discourse of the quandaries of the soul, it was Aristotle's treatise on the de anima that continued to dominate our conception of mind until modern day psychology was established as a distinct discipline. For Aristotle, the object of psychology is to discover the essence of the soul and its attributes or properties. In book one of his treatise on the soul, he lays out the mind-body problem by asking whether the soul is divisible into parts, and if so, whether they are distinct from the body. Here he contextualizes the notion of parts as a plurality of functions with discernible properties as distinct from the whole, as well as the problematic of separating out affections such as sensation, appetite, passion, perception, emotion, and concludes that in order to act or to be acted upon, soul has to possess a body as a prerequisite of its existence. Therefore, any study of the soul f uh, falls within the science of nature, <coughs> as he would say, as a composite of embodied events. This is the making of modern psychological science. It is in book two where Aristotle gives an answer to the question, what is soul? Here he provides his famous distinction of matter as potentiality from form or essence as actuality. 
and concludes that soul is a compound of the two as life. Here, psyche and soma form a unit or a union as a living being. Soul is not only a living thing with degrees of actuality and potentiality, it is an enactment of actualized potential as a capacity. Aristotle continues to delineate various functions, characteristics, or as he says, psychic powers of the soul that belong to organized natural living bodies such as self-nutrition, growth, decay, and so on, with hierarchical degrees of enhancement in animals, such as sensation and perception, and for humans, intellect or thought. For Aristotle, the capacity to sense, perceive, and desire is common to all species. But what differentiates the human being from animals is the outgrowth or derivative properties of cognition. Here there are three advanced faculties humans possess. Imagination, which in turn relies on memory, and reason, which is unique to man. Aristotle review, uh, viewed imagination as a derivative of sensation, whereby the manifold sense objects and after images, as he put it, appear to the soul as distinct psychical phenomena, even while dreaming. He has a whole paper on dreams. The distinguished um, Aristotelian scholar, Sir David Ross, notes that the acts of imagination involve not a conscious state of mind, but an unconscious modification of the mind, due to the fact that mental processes are operative before recollection takes place, which is dependent on memory. Until mind recollects the deposits of sense perception recorded within the tableau of the unconscious, they persist in a state of potentiality before they are made actual by the imaginative faculty. In extending Aristotle's views, we may, we may also say that potentiality as such is an unconscious presence that is always there, the task of which is to make it actual through reflection and recollection. Here Aristotle anticipates Hegel's psychology, which uh, we will examine in the chapter, but uh, where there is a sort of unconscious intelligence that mediates images and stored objects within the abyss of the mind. Or originally laid down and re retained as sensations, after images can take on a life of their own, as we may observe in fantasy, and are reproduced by the faculty of imagination as representations that are unconsciously derived. This is why Aristotle states, quote, thinking is different from perceiving and is held to be in part imagination, in part judgment, end quote. Notice that imagination and thought intermingle. Here we may appreciate why Hegel claims that, quote, fantasy is reason, end quote. In other words, unconscious valences intervene during any act of thinking, especially fantasy. It is important to emphasize that these advanced forms of cognition are epigenetic achievements. They develop from primordial organic processes, such as biological instincts, and gain synthetic organizational ability or endowment responsible for reflective thought and behavior. This is why the soul is determinative. It executes a causal impetus over the life activities of a living thing through animate action as agency. For Aristotle, the soul is the psychic faculty that allows us to live as sentient and thinking beings. But with this single caveat, it cannot exist without a body. The standard uh, Ross translation reads, quote, the soul cannot be without a body, while it cannot be a body. It is not a body, but something relative to a body, end quote. Now, in comparison, the creed translation is similar, quote, 
Neither can the soul exist without the body, nor is it a body. It is not a body, but has something to do with the body, and for this reason it is present in body. End quote. Now, on the one hand, soul possesses a body, but on the other, it is not a body. In other words, the soul is embodied, but it cannot be reduced to matter or material substance. This is Aristotle's language for what today we may refer to as non-reductive materialism. If mind is embodied as uh, inhering within mass extended in space, where the affections of the soul are in mattered actions, or in accounts, end quote, then what becomes of the question of immateriality generally attributed to the soul? Keep in mind this question is prefaced on the historical Christianization of the word soul, which typically signifies an immaterial, incorporeal, or supernatural independent existence that the so-called immortal psyche assumes over the physical cessation of the body at death. Where in other languages, such as German, soul, or Seele, is devoid of these theological connotations, as is mind or spirit, Geist. Unlike Plato, for Aristotle, the soul is not an independently existing substance, nor is it incorporeal. It is neither a material object, nor is it separated from the body. In other words, soul is not separable from the body, nor is it conceived as a body. Herein lies the paradox of inseparability of the soul from body. While the psyche is not a body, it is not immaterial. Yet it remains embodied. Psyche and soma are not different substances. Rather, they are differentiated elements of the same substance hence conjoined within a monistic structure. Yet Aristotle may be said to introduce a contradiction here, and even waffles on the notion of form and matter being independent of one another. While they may be categorically separable, hence uh, thought of as distinct through the act of abstraction, ontologically they are not. Furthermore, mind and body are not ontologically identical. Hence, they are not the same and cannot be collapsed into one another, contrary to the identification thesis advanced by modern materialism. Nor are they merely categorically, uh, categorical distinctions because the soul qua form transcends its biological counterpart in terms of its capacities, functions, organizational complexity, and self-defining agency, which by definition gives it greater powers evaluating properties Evaluing properties, matter itself does not intrinsically possess, although sentience, desire, and perception are necessarily embodied and cannot exist independent of soul. All this roundabout, uh, by today's standards, uh, Aristotle has set the stage for a discourse on the irreconcilability of the dialectic between psyche and substance which we often see in contemporary cognitive neuroscience as a duality or po polarity between mind and brain. The tendency today among the biological sciences is to boil, boil down mind to brain states or neurochemical, physical, systemic substances uh, vitiates the philosophical need to preserve the integrity of soul as a vitalizing, self-directing, regulatory process of generative, valuative, self-creative agency that transpires within the embodied parameters of its natural givenness or thrownness. Aristotle's views on the soul preserve both the natural scientific attitude of explaining the physical world as an empirical object of, of investigation as well as valuing the transcendental properties of mind that resist reductionistic strategies hell-bent on displacing its determinative freedom through the mendacity and simple-minded devolution of materialism. Although soul is an actuality, 
It is in its self-capacity to actualize itself as the coming into being of potentiality that signals its agentic potency. It is in the prowess of agency that soul achieves its pinnacle as thought. This is one reason why we do not phenomenologically equate our minds with our bodies. For a reflective experience of our internal experiences is a higher order accomplishment of self-consciousness, or in Hegelianese, a sublation uh, of mind, alphabum. We do not relate to ourself as brain, but rather as a transcendent organizational being with a qualitative mediatory purpose as a self-imposed pursuit and meaning. And that determines the course of how we wish to act over our body, despite the fact that our bodies, including brain dependence as supervenience, have functional and organic constraints over how we choose to think and behave. What is extraordinary about Aristotle's arguments is that he both venerates the naturalized notion that mind cannot exist independent from our embodiment, what contemporary science would reiterate is simply an empirical fact, while at the same time refusing to reduce mind to matter or material substance, which it admonishes scientific prejudices favoring reductionism by allowing mind to enjoy concurrent degrees of freedom in causal efficacy, form, qualia, and self-definition. Here the existential capacity to think, reflect, choose, and deliberately act qualitatively differentiates the human soul from its simple biological, hence causal, constitution. For Aristotle, the, the crux of what it is to be, or, sorry, what it is to be a psychic entity or possess mind ultimately subordinates individuality and personal experience to a general collective essence. For soul is universal form that applies to all. This is why soul entails a metaphysical factor, for it epitomizes a universality within a concrete particularity. What or we participate of a general impersonal psychic essence that may be said to apply to all people regardless of historicity, gender, race, location, or time, an anima mundi, so to speak. From Aristotle to Hegel, Jung, and Whitehead, we may see why logic, as the essence of pure thought thinking about itself and its operations, may be attributed to a superordinate process animating the universe. And what is most peculiar to this universal form is that it obeys an unconscious logic, a logic of the interior, something concealed yet manifest. So I'm, I'm almost done. Setting aside for the moment the ancient tendency to import an immaterial incorporeal and immortal dimension to the soul that carries with it a naive, uh, incredulous, supernatural properties, the Greeks were the first to give serious thought to the essence of the psyche as a complex psychological composition and governance responsible for interceding in all human experience, including the quest for the spiritual and the equiprimordiality of desire pining for satisfaction. To this day, the ancients' meditations on psychic reality remain an unequivocal bedrock for understanding human phenomena, including the psychodynamics of motivation, cognition, and reason. In individual and social psychology, mental well-being and suffering, communal relations, political and economic unconscious structures, ethical, aesthetic, and cultural cultivation, and the convoluted process of civilization forged on power, aggression, violence, love and compassion, social negotiation, and democracy. From tragedy to thanatology, the struggle over bodily passions, affective impulses, rational choice, and ethical comportment 
including reconciling the good with the bad, pleasure and pain, creativity amongst destruction, truth over opinion, and folly from wisdom, all transpiring within a dialect dialectical underworld, vacillating between sex and death, is the hallmark of modern consciousness. It is rather remarkable that, all of, that in all of the philosophies of the unconscious that I examine in my book, from the summit of German idealism to psychoanalysis, existentialism, and process metaphysics, we may rightfully appreciate what Whitehead means when he says that all Western European philosophy is merely, quote, a series of footnotes to Plato, end quote. The notion of, of depth psychology with its topography of the soul, including the interdependence of drive, desire, and pathos, instrumental in the ascendance of reason, aesthetics, the numinous, and ethical self-consciousness, may be viewed as an ancient discovery. But like Hades and the notion of Aletheia, one that remained hidden in those times, concealed yet always present. Just as the Delphic maxim inscribed in the Proneos at the temple of Apollo cautioned all visitors to, quote, know thyself, the psychoanalytic attitude upholds the value of insight and self-knowledge over the shrouded interior of the life within.